Welcome everybody to this evening's conversation, The Loss of Green, Imaging Vegetal Worlds, hosted by the MIT Wiesner Student Art Gallery, uh, current artist and organized by her, Nancy Valladares. My name is Sarah Herzl. Hi, Nancy. Um, I'm the coordinator of the gallery. For anyone who has any questions or interest in the gallery in the future, please let me know. Um, we will put a link to the gallery in the chat. Before Nancy introduces her partners, Samina Long Callison and Shireen Hamza, I want to invite everyone to submit questions for the Q&A using the chat function, which we'll read later. Please keep your microphone muted during the event um, when our speakers are um, having their conversation, but later there'll be a chance in the Q&A for everyone um, to participate. And we really encourage you to use the raise hand button, come on screen, and we look forward to a lively conversation. Without further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Nancy Valladares, Samina Long Callison, and Shireen Hamza. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, thank you, everyone, for you know coming to the talk. Um, so, the Lots of Green Imaging Vegetal Worlds is part of, like uh, you know, Sarah mentioned the online exhibit um, that uh, I was invited to do at the Wiesner Gallery. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for all your support and to all the you know, staff members who made this possible. Um, so I am just going to give a very brief uh, description of what the work is because there was already a um, gallery um, sort of like walkthrough which will be made available shortly. Um, and also the, 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 the link to the show will be put in the description at some point which you're, you're more than welcome to go and take a look at it. Um, but uh, so my work was uh, you know, the specific project Botanical Ghosts was part of a three-year investigation into the agricultural histories um, and botanical histories of Honduras, specifically uh, in Lancetia Botanical Gardens, which is located in the North Coast. Um, and, you know, my art practice is a multidisciplinary offering for botanical imaginaries. Um, and my thought of this practice is a metabolism through which internal becomings can happen. Um, and uh, today I have the honor of moderating this talk between Samina and Shireen. Um, I'm very excited for the conversation that will take place today. Um, so first that uh, I will like to introduce Samina. Um, Samina Long Callison is a historian who recently received her master's in architecture studies in the history theory and criticism Art and architecture department from MIT in 2020. Um, Samina's work examines colonial national museums in Denmark, Malaysia, and Singapore, as well as contemporary artistic practices that respond to such institutions. Um, she holds a BA in art history with distinction from the University of Cambridge. Um, and she was also a Fialco Fellow and a Paulson researcher at MIT, uh, and is currently a fellow at the Curie Museum of Art in New Hampshire as well as a researcher uh, at the Mexico City-based architecture practice, Arco del Est. Um, her research is, uh, has been published in the Journal of the Malaysian branch of the Rojo Asiatic Society and the Danish National Gallery's Perspective Journal. And today, Samina will share with us um, both part of her research and her recipe website, Garden Blues, um, which is a personal iteration of the work that she's done in the archive. Um, and uh, Shireen Hamza is a historian and current, a, a current PhD candidate in history of science at Harvard University. Um, her dissertation project is a reassessment of the concept of Islamic medicine by studying scholarly medical traditions across the Indian Ocean world. Working on texts of both Galenic and Ayurvedic medicine composed in Arabic and Persia between in Arabic and Persian between the 13th and 15th centuries, she shows the coexistence of an exchange between multiple traditions of healing, as well as the transformation of disease categories and medicinal substances in Yemen and Gujarat. Her work has been supported by the Social Science Research Council and the Fulbright Commission, um, and she's the managing editor for the Ottoman History Podcast and wrote and produced Ventricles, a podcast on science outside of the West. Um, so I would like to just, you know, talk a little bit about um, the thoughts behind organizing this talk and why Samina and Shireen, you know, had the, I had the privilege of being in conversation with them and, you know, this kind of coming together really fluidly. Um, and the dialogue between us spans uh, several geographies and temporalities. 
um, and of this crossing of botanical exchanges, sensory encounters, and archival histories um, lie the practices of Sharina and Samina, whose work I deeply admire and have been inspired by. Um, the title of this talk comes from an essay published by Prudence Gibson on the color green. And I wanted to read to you a very small excerpt um, uh, where she writes, um, it is due to the loss of green from our everyday habitats that greenness is more than a hue of nostalgia. It has also become a keen political weapon, an activated and dynamic arena of civic and civil debate. Thinking green is the same as thinking for the long now, where plans and concepts need to have longevity and long distance strategic clout. Um, so to me, um, this, you know, this, this phrase, this title, the loss of green, uh, invokes the presence of uh, an ecological past, um, what Anna Singh and Donna Haraway refer to as the plantation scene, um, which has been ongoing uh, through negotiations of what is considered to be living and non-living. In some ways, my desire for this talk was to look at this ecological present and speculate on the future through the lens of this vegetal past. What does the now look like after centuries of hybridizations of bioprospecting and of the ongoing extractive relationships between humans and the vegetal world? Both Samina and Shireen's practices unearth knowledge through different sensoriums. From the sense of taste and smell in the various cuisines that make their appearance in Samina's project, Garden Blues, to Shireen's engagement with descriptions of plants and medicinal practices through the written word. Beyond solely images, both of, both of their works take on the role of animating the specimens and manuscripts in the archive. What drew me to their respective practices was how they engage with the affect of these repositories, challenging and blurring the roles of the historian and the witness. So please welcome both Simina and um, Shireen. I am going to hand it over to our first presenter, um, which I believe is uh, Simina, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I'm just going to kind of hand it over to you and uh, welcome. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's so good to see so many friends and familiar faces and new ones, too. Um, Nancy, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to be here. I'm excited to talk with you and Shireen and, and share my thoughts with you guys and with everyone else. So. Um, as Nancy mentioned, my work um, focuses mostly on British colonial history, a colonial history um, in Malaysia or Malaya as it was known. Um, and I've looked specifically at colonial museums during the 19th century. They existed uh, in most places in the British empire and were large repositories of mineral and plant specimens. Um, and the museums were important to colonial administration um, because they functioned as laboratories um, that worked in the service of a, a general search for revenue. So in Malaysia, these museums carried out botanical experiments with rubber and palm oil. And eventually these uh, cash crops transformed the landscape of Malaysia um, and turned it into a very lucrative uh, colony of one of the main exporters of rubber and, and oil, palm oil. So curiously, later in the 20th century, um, museums came to play a role of, um, of guardians of nature. They spearheaded conservation, nature conservation as nature was disappearing uh, outside the museum walls. Um, due to the industries that the museums themselves had engineered. Uh, so the museum has this double role of both destroying and preserving. Um, and the colonial museum also became a mirror of self for specific parts of the independence movement in Malaysia. Um, so they were initially part of a big colonial infrastructure that rendered Malaya readable and exploitable and governmental, um, but these collected artifacts and uh, specimens of natural history were also adopted by nationalist movements um, and they came to represent a distinct national identity. So thoughts about uh, colonial botany and industries 
and identity uh, has been on my mind for a while. Um, and when I met Nancy a couple of years ago, uh, and we started cooking together, we realizing that we realized that there were a lot of overlapping flavors. Um, and this was a surprise to me because in my head, Honduras was is very far away from Malaysia. Um, but I was, as we dug into the history of these places, we realized that uh, there were lots of um, the similarities were due to um, the geographies being ports in the same imperial networks. So Honduras and Malaysia are not formally or fully part of the same empires, but people like Dorothy Popano and Wilson Popano, who are the protagonists, uh, so to speak, in Nancy's Botanical Ghost, her, her artwork. Um, these two figures were American um, and British explorers and discoverers who traveled to Malaysia and Honduras and documented um, plant species there and carried with them seeds from one botanical station to another across the tropical belt. Um, so from my experiences uh, with cooking with Nancy and uh, from working in the archive emerged a more uh, poetic iteration of my research work. Um, it's a recipe website called uh, Garden Blues, which is inspired by Honduran, Honduran and Malaysian cuisine. Um, and I'm going to share with you my screen so you can see the website. Um, so I should say that in creating this uh, site, I've received a lot of help, um, especially um, from Agnes Cameron, who built it with me and who thought with me about his story. So big thank you to Agnes. Um, so the landing site is a bunch of um, gardens and rivers that are named after memories and themes and places. And um, each garden and river is populated by flowers, a wavy little squiggles. And if you click on a flower, it will take you to a recipe that's associated with the theme of the place. So um, if we go to the Taiping Lake Gardens, which is in the north of Malaysia, um, a recipe for this coconut pan fried cake will come up. Um, and if we go to Garden of Cash Crops down here, um, recipe for the beloved plantains will come up. And then lastly, um, if we go to the Garden of Blues, another dessert uh, will come up. So the site also has an index with a list of um, recipes and a writing block where um, I think about the theory and the histories that is behind the site. So um, through food, um, I think this recipe site tells a story about itinerant colonial nature that travels that travel through the, the tropics. And it also tells a story of about hybridity. Um, I think it's a pushback against nationalist ideas um, of where things belong. Um, it's a pushback against authenticity. Um, and personally, it's also um, disturbing the lines between what we think of as local and foreign. Um, and I think it's, in that way, it's a, a reflection of what it means to come from a territory that is much larger than, than the countries that we grew up in. Um, so that's it for me now. I'm going to pass the spotlight to Shireen and stop screen sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Samina. Thank you so much, Samina. That was so, so interesting. And I can't wait for the discussion. Um, so I'm a historian of medicine in the medieval Indian, or sorry, the medieval Islamic world. 
a time before European empires shaped and were shaped by capital S science. And I spend my days reading manuscripts written out over the centuries by physicians who lived in the regions bordering the Indian Ocean world. The manuscripts that you see here <laughs> uh, all feature descriptions of plants in alphabetical order, or rather those parts of plants that were most relevant to medicine. So physicians needed to know the therapeutic application of these, these parts. But with the exception of those few who actively foraged and studied botany, they did not encounter plants growing in their environments as wholes. Foragers, farmers, traders, they were the ones who supplied markets with the dried roots, stems, leaves, flowers, resins, powders that were actually used by physicians. And these processed forms of the plant could travel whether to local markets or to those across the ocean. While there was a more rarefied tradition of illustrated botanical manuscripts, even these centered human uses of and relations to plants. They never claimed to offer a universal system of classification. The descriptions that you see here included information on where the plant grows, its different variants, the color of its usable parts, and their taste and smell in relation to other medicinal substances. These were a practical set of comparisons. But when I close my eyes and try to picture the history of botany, I don't actually imagine the millions of extant pages of Arabic and Persian manuscripts in libraries across Eurasia and the US. I see instead the bright illustrated plant typologies of European colonial botany which I have encountered as framed prints hung up on the walls of countless inns, cafes, and shops. The more history I learn, the more sinister my encounters with these aestheticized forms have felt, erasure after erasure. As historian Daniela Blechmar, Blechmara has argued, efforts to make the empire visible always made parts of it invisible. The authors were those who could lay claim to the intellectual work of observing and classifying, writing it all down in colonial languages. Unmentioned were those doing the manual labor of procuring the specimens or of painting their portraits. Nancy's work in Botanical Ghosts brilliantly evokes the macabre lives and afterlives of these images made by people who, quote, chose to accept the death of many things. 18th century naturalists aspired to represent plants as more real than reality, a generalized typology accessible only with great skill and difficulty. They were intentionally and aggressively selective, extracting the typical from the particulars of individual specimens, not, quote, distracted by irrelevant details and accidental traits. A leaf torn by an insect, a wilting flower, or a flower not fully bloomed. Historians Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison call this kind of knowing truth to nature. Idealized botanical images had a generality that transcended the species to, quote, reflect a never seen but nonetheless real plant archetype. But as Bleichmara and Landa Scheibinger have argued, this kind of botanical expertise was so highly valuable in the 18th century, where botany was quote, big business and big science. Botanical expeditions were expensive, deploying large teams of naturalists, artists, and laborers, and requiring the active participation of a whole imperial administrative apparatus. Governors, treasury officials, physicians, pharmacists, clergymen, and many other local populations, town to town in the Americas. Botanical images were implicated in their investors' desires for future profit. Economic botany shaped the fate of uncountable plants and people who were commodified within a plantation economy. The violent ends to which these images contributed are another major difference from the medieval traditions of botany and pharmacopoeia that I study. Nancy transforms idealized illustrations of the Aki tree into a uniformly gray, rotating 3D model, gesturing at the continuity of truth to nature in contemporary cultures of scientific modeling. 
and defamiliarizing these ubiquitous and highly aestheticized illustrations. In the narrative of botanical ghosts, I witness Dorothy's senses heighten. Her boundaries of self dissolve into the specificity of Lancetia's lives and deaths. In imagining this intensely local story in Dorothy's lives, the sense of thereness that Nancy describes, um, and um, sorry, in imagining this intensely local story in Dorothy's life and the sense of thereness that she felt, Nancy evokes a time scale that transcends that of empire and challenge challenges the totalizing universal way of seeing and classifying that the Linnaean system proposed. Truth to nature images often divorced plants from the environment where they grow and the culture and knowledge of the people who cultivate or forage them. Quote, rejecting the local as contingent, subjective and translatable, favoring instead the dislocated global as objective, truthful and permanent. A lot changed from the composition of these medieval medical texts in the 14th century uh, to Carl Linnaeus in the 18th to Dorothy Popino in the 20th, but I was really surprised to find a moment of recognition in this sentence of the narrative of botanical ghosts. Dorothy told herself she was not one to believe in spirits, especially the ones that she heard about among the workers of Lancetia. Though learned medieval sciences were not as totalizing as the modern sciences have become, nor as separate or privileged within hierarchies of knowledge, their practitioners still policed the boundaries of their disciplines. While farmers, miners, traders, and foragers had valuable knowledge, physicians and botanists relied on to learn local particulars and to locate beneficial plant, animal, and mineral substances, their names only seldom enter the texts as sources and do not have the same prestige as those of ancient textual authorities. Though these relationships were quite different from that of Dorothy's to the workers on Lancetia, uh, on Lancetia the continuity of scientific exclusion was one that I was unprepared to face. Nancy does not dwell on this racist and classist violence in Dorothy's discourse. She mentions it somewhat obliquely, privileging instead the voice of the Aki tree and Dorothy's terrifying and transformative encounter with it. At a recent Union Docs event, artist Madeline Hunt Ehrlich spoke about, the, about abstraction as a form of opacity and opacity as a strategy used by black artists as a way to protect themselves and their audiences from historical violence. This struck me as an apt way of understanding Nancy's engagement with the colonial archive of botany in Honduras. She still makes images to mediate something of this visual past, however opaque the transmission, but it is a history thoroughly haunted by the radical vibrancy of plants. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shireen um, and Samina, both of you for these really you know, amazing and incredible presentations of your work. Um, I'm very excited to you know, start to kind of jump into the discussion so we have as much time as we can. Um, but um, I really, I wanted to have like, uh, maybe I'd start out with a, a question that both of you could answer um, about uh, your experiences as you know, historians. Um, and, uh, you know, what, I, I would really like to know a little bit more about um, the sensory and affective experiences that you've both kind of experienced um, in these different archives and repositories um, and sort of like the, you know, the kind of things that do not get written into, you know, like, you know, the academic text and, you know, the, these kind of projects that are, um, I think challenging these kind of boundaries again of like historian and witness. And um, I would like to kind of like enter the conversation through. So I was wondering if one of you could, you know, kind of jump in um, and we could just kind of unmute and just keep the conversation flowing. Um, I can, I can start. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how um, behind the writing of history, there is a lot of archive work that goes into producing um, 
text, which is not necessarily included. Um, I think something that I didn't mention in my presentation um, and that also doesn't come through in the, the recipe website is that in the, the natural realm included um, people and um, anthropological studies of people were uh, also appearing in studies of, of plants. Um, so there is this curious, um, the British natural history includes both uh, locals, different races and religion, um, what today is categorized as cultural artifacts. Um, but then in the early colonial museums in the 19th century, these were categorized as, as nature. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking to this a little bit um, in this idea of the colonial museum transitioning into the, the national museum. So the natural resource, both labor and um, nature later on becomes um, this mirror of self, like uh, locals see themselves mirrored in, um, in natural history museums. The, the, the natural resource becomes like this, this enters the cultural realm and becomes like a cultural a resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. And Samina, when you were talking about the um, the kind of porosity of different empires and how, you know, even though your two family histories may be kind of filed away into two separate empires, I think, I thought that was really interesting how they, you know, they come together in the, in the kitchen at least, um, and how we can't really just study Spanish empire or British empire as two separate things. Um, but I, I also love to hear what you said about the relationship between museums and co conservation and the kind of like temporality of the past, the idea of salvage that animated so much of anthropology. And I'd love to hear at some point you say more about um, about what museums, you know, what muse what role museums did play in this kind of idea of conservation. But um, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to, to answer Nancy's question by talking about um, where all those manuscript images you guys saw like where I encountered them. And um, it was all in the UK and online World Digital Library or like Yale University's Beinecke Library. Like these are all places really diff like far and removed from the context where these manuscripts were written. So when I go to say like the British Library's Oriental Studies Reading Room, <laughs> which is like full of these portraits of like I don't know, like major kind of people in the colon in British colonial history uh, from Asia and Africa. Like it just, it feels so strange to me. Um, there was a moment uh, when I was there during my dissertation research where uh, there there's a manuscript of a 14th century um, pharmacological and medical text, Ikhtiarat uh, Badi'i, which is a Persian text. And the British Library has a copy of this text, like copied by the author's son. So it's really close to the author's life and kind of, this is a very kind of a precious <laughs> sort of object. And um, I, I don't know how many people ever really order it or like want to see it. But if it was in a different context, um, you know, I think there would be a lot of people who would be really happy to be able to access that manuscript somewhere maybe where Persian is spoken um, and so those things happen like every day and it's so strange to be um, like to know to recognize that the knowledge system I'm studying is hierarchical I'm, I'm not trying to idealize it mm -hmm. but to to just be like you know to look it in the face every day that this is this is removed from its context um, either by theft or by purchased under duress or any any number of, of, of ways that these manuscripts kind of make their ways into these libraries and archives. And then to, to balance that with like the moments of discovery, like moments of like, oh, this is so great for my research <laughs> to feel happy while handling these manuscripts. It, it feels very sort of like competing, um, competing moments. And that's why I really, really connected with that aspect of your project, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Um, this sort of like, you know, entering an archive of violence, but finding 
very human narratives and constructing and and sort of speculating as to the subjectivity of those people rather than just kind of shutting it out. Right. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Serena. And I mean, I think um, that's something else that I, I thought that both of your, you know, your works were doing was also challenging um, very much the kind of uh, ways in which, you know, the construction of nature, um, you know, was happening through different Sense, you know, senses. Um, and I, I briefly mentioned in the introduction, you know, and Samina and yours, um, it's through this kind of like exchange of like flavors and tastes, and smells and cuisines, you know, that was happening. Um, and uh, Shireen, um, through these kind of like descript, you know, descriptions of, um, you know, plant species and medicinal practices that, you know, um, require a certain perhaps other kind of knowledge that is, you, I don't know if it exists any longer or doesn't, um, but, you know, I mean, I was curious whether there was any way in which these kind of readings or expansions of the senses, um, when it comes to imagining vegetal imaginaries, um, you know, what can we learn today about that? Or what are those things challenging um, in terms of this very visual, um, you know, you know, history that centers vision as the sole way of, you know, kind of constructing nature or imagining and remembering. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know, I was curious to hear a little bit more about that from both of you, because, um, you know, these things that like kind of are engaging, uh, you know, different parts, different, uh, you know, essentially sensory encounters um, in history, uh, I think, challenge kind of existing narratives. Um, so I was wondering if you could both briefly talk about that. I don't know, Shireen, maybe. <laughs> well, um, I definitely, I mean, that was definitely the point of the Zoom background, just to show mm -hmm. that like, for so many people using these plants, they're not, there are no illustrations in front of them. You know, they're not encountering the plant as a whole. They're they're sort of reading and memorizing. There's a lot of memorization involved. So the textuality of the practice, um, I didn't include too many images of a, um, a poetic text, but like a lot of the texts I'm looking at are in didactic poetry. So people can memorize them and like kind of the inseparability of object and, and text, um, whether that's like memorized and oral or or like being read aloud um, from a text is, is really is really present. And those were often comparisons. They were often about, okay, this this powder like of this root will taste slightly more bitter than this other things that you will definitely have tasted before. And so I just, you know, it, it evokes an image of these um, sort of folks in the bazaar in a marketplace, like just tasting stuff. <laughs> and ingesting ingesting medicines to make sure that the quality and the the sort of identification of the of the of the substance is correct and it, it will actually be therapeutic mm -hmm. um and i i i would like to say that this like some forms of this medical tradition are still practiced mm -hmm. um and there definitely are people who um, who keep this alive, whether it's recognized by post-colonial nations like India and Pakistan or in Bangladesh, where like Yunani medicine is usually what it's called today, is like a, regulated by the state, or whether it's, um, you know, for example, in the Middle East, where, or in parts of like East Africa, mm -hmm. um, even West Africa, this sort of tradition is practiced, but um, it's not, it's sort of not recognized um, in the, to the same level in most of these countries. Like it's, mm -hmm you know, biomedicine is medicine mm -hmm. and everything else is alternative or traditional and, you know, and, and does face, um, because of the lack of resources and lack of re regulation, often um, people are sometimes, you know, harmed by it, but people are harmed by me biomedicine too. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty complicated, but I, I would say that there are definitely people who continue um, to, uh, to interact with, um, with medicines through sense senses like uh, primarily smell and taste um, mm -hmm. more than sight, but I also know that those who practice this tradition today, their education is completely different, and has become often has become biomedicalized, and that the sight sight has thus um, become more 
but yeah I've, I visited some of these schools of Yunani medicine and mm -hmm. um, like there's like a laboratory you know like of one of the classrooms um, that I went to had these jars of just powders and mm -hmm. and dried roots and they had like this was like a wall of jars mm -hmm. and the students who graduate from that need to be able to identify each of those without you know knowing what what the label says so there there definitely are people who still are training in these ways of of knowing yeah um i find that actually also like a really good segue into a question that i have for samina's work which had to do with um this relationship that you briefly mentioned samina between the museum the garden and the laboratory which um there seems to be this kind of like continuity of transformation that happens you know um between you know, these like places that began as kind of like experimental botanical stations or or places for, you know, essentially biolog you know, it, it essentially a a kind of like laboratory in a plain air uh, would then become these other things. Um, and I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that and how it comes about in your work. Sure. Um, so the museum buildings would often have attached to them a smaller botanical garden where um, the people who worked at the museums experimented with seeds and um, different um, plants. And I think what is what we have talked about is that these um, botanical institutions were in the colonial context were um, deeply involved with extraction and displa displacement of people and importing labor. Um, but they were also strange um, places where amateurs worked. The British colonial officers were not necessarily trained or educated in uh, biology or botany. So a lot of them were steered by um, eccentric people who had bought botany as a hobby. And a lot of the collections were accidentally assembled. So these collections do can come across as encyclopedic and uh, Shireen, you mentioned like taxonomy, they can have this very um, overwhelming and um, powerful impact on you, but they were also often chaotic bureaucracies with small um, budgets. And when they were then passed on to like thinking about the transformation when they were passed on to national movements. Um, they became sort of no a nostalgic uh, place for what has one once been. Um, these, uh, they were sites of abundance, of a lost uh, diversity, biodiversity. Um, so yeah, I mean, they are, they are strange, the, the botanical gardens, the ones in Honduras and the ones in Malaysia as well as strange places because they supposedly reflect a reality outside of their little delineated space. But those are all, all usually quite extraordinary places with a very high um, diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, speaking, and, and you know, in terms of these like kind of like delineations, um, you know, it's, I. I I cannot help but think about uh, you know these sort of kind of plantation logics that would then emerge from um, you know these like really specific kind of like exper you know exper sites of experimentation and um, you know in Latakia particularly that experimental station you know um, it it basically produced a matrix of um, of living things um, which. Uh, you know, this kind of uh, plantation logic will attempt to, you know, create hierarchies and of organisms, you know, of life that are uh, embedded into these like kind of logics, but they have a history, you know, that kind of comes from, um, you know, these all of these relationships that um, have been kind of constructed throughout history, you know, like um, that are passed down through these kind of like collections. Um, you know, there's almost like an assembly line that 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 produces these kind of extractive relationalities, um, and so I, I really find that through uh, by looking at these kind of like histories, you know, like and and these kind of like collections, small collections, one is able to kind of almost see into the present um, and perhaps extrapolate into the future, um, and uh, which brings me to another question that I have to both of you. Um, 
I guess like, I don't know if this is maybe too, too much of a positive thing, but I was curious if you had thoughts on what can be learned from these kind of readings, you know, um, of the vegetal imagination, botanical kind of like history um, for our present. And can these things, you know, um, you know, help us create other imaginaries and other relationships to nature and, uh, you know, to plants, the vegetal world. So, um, yeah, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on that. I, I've honestly not been thinking about this that long. Like, I know there are people here who are, like, thoroughly plant people. And I don't think that I've kept a plant alive for longer than, like, three or four years. So... <laughs> You know, they're still alive, but, like, uh, this is a relatively recent chapter in my life, so maybe I should let others say, um, like, I, I want to plug the work of Nicholas Roth, who's on the skull, um, who's doing an amazing project about uh, botany in early modern South Asia across Persian and Brajbasha, and, like, he's, like, a plant person, you know? He sees, like, a painting, and he's like, this is this plant, and this is that plant, which is awesome. But I have been really influenced by um, Natasha Meyer's idea of the planthropocene, and um, just the idea that um, moving somewhere different, like breaking the trajectory of, of consumption and climate crisis would really require tuning into other ways of sensing and of being. Um, it's something that I think, um, Nancy, you call microbial subjectivities and vegetal life, which I just loved. Um, yeah, but Samina, I don't know if you have thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, Shirin, you used your work is about medicine and in a way healing. Um, and I want to return to the idea of the botanical gardens or the museums, the colonial museums as kind of contradictory spaces. Um, the certain botanical stations, at least that I'm familiar with um, in Malaysia served for instance as retreat places for um, Victorian English women who had been diagnosed um, with like frail health. Um, so I think that is a curious um, doubleness to the, to the gardens. Um, I also think it's, I mean, through my little uh, personal food projects and garden blues, it's, um, thinking about healing through these uh, places that have done so much harm. I don't know if that is actually um, possible, but I do think that there's a lot of value in, in deepening a knowledge about these places and it gives you a, a broader perspective of how we ended up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to ask Shireen about, um, about hybridity uh, and plant exchanges, perhaps, um, before the colonial encounter, and if you can speak to that a little bit more. Sure, yeah, I've been really influenced by um, Projit Mukherjee's concept of braided knowledge for Ayurveda, um, really thinking about I mean, he's working on the colonial period, but he's pointing out that all of the, you know, so-called great, great traditions um, were already um, hybrid and, and plural, even, you know, when they started to be encountered by Europeans um, more frequently from the 16th century onward. And so um, definitely it has been fascinating for me to be studying Ayurvedic ideas in Persian and um, the kind of selectiveness also of which things are, are translated and which things are not. Um, so I think like uh, there's a different feeling about it because about those kinds of um, braidings uh, because uh, the, their science was not like totalizing, it was not implicated so deeply in how the state governs and the state did not have as um, invasive a presence in the lives of most individuals as the modern state and so I feel like the stakes of the question are quite different than um, in say the 19th century but but yeah I do I do really um, even though hybridity has gotten a lot of flack from a lot of people for for good reasons um, 
I think it's really important to think about traditions as always already hybrid. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we actually just got a really great question from Caroline Jones. Hi, Caroline. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, so it's, uh, uh, she asks, I'm curious about the gender threads in the discussion in Western early modernism, which is where the females in command of botany and cures. The professionalization of curing was a gender control project among other things. Um, how does Nancy and Samina and Shireen see this question in the non-Western context? Um, and yeah, that is a really great question. I don't know if either of you like wanna go, like just, I definitely. I mean, I kind of wanna aim it at you, Nancy, because you know, you've got a complicated intersection here with the colonialist yeah. who's mm -hmm. female, yep. right? So, you know, I know that, um, you know, Schiebinger's work is about, you know, as well as Natalie Davis, about someone like Sibylla Marion mm -hmm. going on the ships of discovery and then talking to the women about the abortifacients. Yeah. Right? So, so there's like a, a possibility of intersectionality there that's interesting, but in your different context, it might just, right, it might just be kind of canceled out. And for Shireen, I'm also inspired by the work of um, the HTC PhD student, Metha Amarazuzi, maybe you know her. Anyway, she's working on poison manuals, which are always like written by men about like women, you know, as the ones who have to hold the potion or, you know, to put some of their urine in it or what, like it's, it's very wet, wrapped through the female world of these Islamic medieval texts she's looking at, these poison manuals, but, but like the women are, are not doing the writing, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just a grab bag question, but I'd love to, to know what you all think about these flows yeah. of power. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I would like to sort of like address the question of Dorothy, which is one that um, you know, Caroline, you were there at the very sort of beginning of this inquiry, and it, it's, um, I will have to admit that I, I don't think I have arrived to a conclusion of what my relationship to this character, Dorothy, specifically is. It's a very complicated one. It's an acknowledgement that she, you know, in her, um, uh, you know, like, sh she essentially helped perpetrate and, you know, spread um, you know, a very specific kind of, uh, of violence, um, you know, while at the same time producing, you know, knowledge that was, um, you know, you know, at the time, you know, considered perhaps maybe forbidden or um, I, I think that in some way it's like um, the question of the control of gender is, is, is really interesting. Um, and, and, and it brings me maybe to think about maybe more about the present, um, because I think that there have definitely been a, a sort of revival of, um, you know, these, you know, practices that are, uh, you know, perhaps considered um, sort of like maybe pseudoscience or this been a sort of like revival of, um, you know, uh, you know, herbalism and essentially witchcraft. Um, and it, I believe that it kind of has transcended in some ways uh, gender and we have a sort of like new, uh, you know, vision of what to relate this relationship to magic and the occult and which is deeply, deeply related to, you know, these kind of like botanical relationships, what that might look like today. Um, and I don't know. I, I feel that uh, Samina, I really hear what you like, you know, talked about with, uh, you know, like these idea, this idea of healing and curing, and you know that like knowledge was, you know, this kind of botanical knowledge was also in some ways gendered, uh, or, or this kind of like way of being in the garden was, you know, specifically also um, a, a kind of, yeah, very pointed, you know. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting all tongue tied, but um, yeah, Caroline, I feel like it's it's very it's complicated, and I don't think I've arrived to any kind of conclusion or kind of terminal point. Um, Good yeah. artistic position. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. I, I mean, thank you so much for this reference. I'm going to follow up um, for the name of the scholar you mentioned. I'd also like to kind of point to Sarah Verskin's book, Barren Women, which just came out uh, last year. And it's, um, it's really interesting because she is deeply interested in, um, in women's knowledge and women's experiences. But her, you know, her sources from the medieval Islamic world are all written by men. And um, I believe she's primarily working in Arabic. She also reads um, some Hebrew sources as well. But um, what what really comes through from that book, like something I'm really taking away from it, is the intensity of male anxieties around women's knowledge and women's spaces. And um, it's it's just astounding sometimes to read, especially like legal scholars, um, not as much physicians, but intensely for legal scholars like Islamic religious scholars, uh, ulama, how they are concerned. And they're not concerned about witchcraft and magic explicitly, but what they are concerned about is that, you know, they have the real Islam. They have the proper and textual Islam as, as male scholars. And when women get together around, especially around like intense moments of, of life and transition, like birth, um, they don't know what kind of practices they're transmitting, and they don't, they don't want that to happen without somebody being there, some man being there, kind of saying what the real, what the real <laughs> Islam is. And so I, I think that, unfortunately, like, um, as became kind of clear to me reading this book, there, there aren't always going to be questions that we can answer about you know, what women's spaces looked like and what what their knowledge looked like in this period, just because they were, except in particular disciplines like hadith, uh, prophetic kind of traditions, they were largely excluded from textual production. Um, so yeah, that's it's been hard to grapple with that, with reading that book this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think <clears throat> I also had like a comment on this um, before we wrap up as we're very close, but uh, do you want to go ahead and yeah i can share um my thought briefly so uh, i think it's a really interesting question because a lot of the colonial offices and civil servants that i that i look at and who left behind the archive and the colonial museums were men but the travel logs there are quite a few travel logs of uh, victorian women who traveled across the british empire and met all of these civil servants and um and documented their conversations and described their character and how they interacted with the locals, their relationship with the locals. So in a way, this travel logs for me was this more like backstage human relationship, what's going on um, between the, the colonial offices. Um, they were written by um, these women who were very wealthy and they spent their life just traveling around. Um, but yeah, I think that's an, at least in the, the text that I've encountered, there's a different kind of category of text that women would have written um, and travel log or like botanical illustrations in those, tra in those travel logs were, is one of them um, that is specifically uh, speaks to the gender question. Yeah, the erasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it's, yeah, it's also interesting. I mean, a lot of botanical illustrators were women um, and it was, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, in my project, in particular project, Dorothy, Dorothy Polfino, um produced a lot of the illustrations that, um, uh, that Wilson Pope and her husband, who was a really famous botanist, um, you know, published. Uh, and it was this kind of like, um, you know, labor of, you know, like reproducing, you know, this kind of like, you know, knowledge that was still, you know, kind of, almost blanketed and obscured by, you know, the, the sort of almost like monumentalizing of, of, of Wilson Pope and kind of career. Um, and uh, so, okay, Sarah just gave me like the little signal that we're very close to wrapping up tonight. Um, but if, you know, anyone would like to kind of like stay afterwards and ask any more questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, but uh, I wanted to say, you know, thank you also to everyone who came and to Samina and Shireen. Um, so if, you know, you'd like to stay and ask a couple more questions, you're more than welcome to. But, um, you know, if 
you know, you have to go also, no worries. Um, but thank you so much, <laughs> Sarah, and, uh, you know, the Wiesner Gallery for opening up this opportunity in this space, uh, for having this really amazing conversation, uh, you know, with these two historians and also artists in their own right, whose work I really deeply admire. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, and yeah, hopefully see you soon. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists. And yes, and those friends who want to stay, you're welcome. Um, but really, we appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, this is um, this sort of bundle of questions. I'm, I'm you know, might. Um, uh, not sure how useful it is, but um, uh, and how much it's just my my own sort of concerns. But um, one thing that I was sort of wondering about is, um, you know, as we were talking about sort of um, colonial imperial contexts writ large, and the uh, and as opposed to sort of a, a pre-colonial or non-colonial uh, context with you, with your work, Shirin. Um, I wonder to what degree, like, you think that that there's a there's a peculiar that there are sort of peculiarities, um, and whether they matter to um, to botanical science as as implemented or as as um, promoted by particular sort of you know Western colonial quote unquote cultures, particular empires, especially with with the sort of obsessive centrality to British imperial identity that that botany has for the Brits to the point where even where where they weren't, you know, where British botanists are and 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 lady travelers who produce botanic illustrations are all over the place, even in colonies that aren't historically British. Mm -hmm. um, and and that you know, and, and there's this particular sort of pattern of of um, that has been relatively well studied and documented uh, of gardens in particular British colonies, um, like Malaya, like in like India, and that have a particular end up having particular relationships to the to the local elites and and their production of knowledge around this uh, on this stuff, um, versus sort of you know, other European empires that where there, where I think we have a comparatively more spotier record, even though, I mean, she even mentioned uh, Daniela Bleichmar's work uh, on, on botany in, in the sort of um, Iberian colonial world. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, like, how, how do those differences in those dynamics matter? I was also just thinking now with the, you know, we have so many in the sort of, ang you know, Anglophone slash Germanic world, from early on, you know, with Marianne and so on, we have all these women producing botanical illustration. Uh, but then for this, for the Spanish imperial expeditions, we have indigenous Mexican artists mm -hmm. who are men, but who are, you know, Mexican born and, and mestizo. Like, where are there parallels or connections there? I don't know, just bundle of questions that might or might not be useful. <laughs> Can I add one question, Nicholas, since you're yes. here, which is like, how do you think about gender in botany and in your work in early modern South Asia? I, um, I haven't engaged with it um, very thoroughly so far uh, because working off, you know, mo like, you know, 16th through 18th century South Asian sources, I have so few um I have so few female voices in the record. Um so where I've where I've touched upon it has merely mostly been in, in regard in the way in the way that um that horticultural spaces and, and, and horticultural labor is imagined and the and and their women yeah, you know, women feature I think relatively prominently, but I, but that almost to the point of it sort of being a poetic con like sort of a literary conceit I think, but it's but this is always with the caveat that that these are the you know the the imaginings or ideals of male authors, um, at least in the in the work that I've that materials that I've looked at so far and and 
and sort of patterns that I've looked at so far. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for that question. Um, I'm an artist, and so I feel like I'm not qualified to answer any of those. <laughs> you know, but um, so, you know, I don't know if you have an answer or like a response, um, or if anyone would also like to follow up with another question, uh, you're more than welcome to mute yourself and also ask one. I think uh, what what came to mind, I think this is more a response than an answer. Um, I th the, the botanical stations and the hill stations that I'm familiar with, um, we're both experimental gardens where uh, British colonial offices in Malaysia collected species from across the empire and also territories beyond. But they were at the same time um, also little miniature versions of British gardens. So I think this comes back to, um, yeah, the contradictory spaces that these places are. It's, bo it's both a place of uh, foreign, quote unquote, foreign imported seeds and uh, plants. But there were also green spaces where um, I think the British made themselves feel at ease or at home. Um, like rose gardens were built next to um, experiments with tobacco and silk. And um, especially in the hills where the climate was more uh, suitable for European plants. Um, yeah, so there's that the the strange kind of coexistence um in these gardens i yeah that's uh a comment i think for you nicholas <laughs> wow that just reminds me of um i'm not super versed in the scholarship but um this you know the production of persian gardens all over south asia and and kind of like the post you know 14th century like explosion of um these forms yeah we actually kind of have like an expert of <laughs> here to talk about that but yeah I just I think that that like I'm trying to like grapple with the part of Nick's question which is like what does what is the distinction say for example between the expansion of like Persian style gardens under the Sultanate into South Asia and the kind of British gardens you're talking about Samina and I feel like it really comes down to um to both labor and epistemology like it's it can't just be like oh the exportation of like ideas and aesthetics like it really also has to do with like the very unique um kinds of like racialized forms of labor that emerge i think in european empire and um i just i don't think that though there are are certainly like social hierarchies in all parts of the world um and like caste deserves mention for sure for South Asia they're just not um I think yeah that shifts as well in the modern you know and um I, I feel like it, I always come back to labor when I'm trying to say like what's the difference between pre-modern and 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 modern empire um labor and as well as like t um just the the totality of scientific discourses like some of the like what you were saying Nicholas like what, what do we do with these like idealized representations of women, for example, or of specific sub like groups or subgroups of people by elite writers? Well, those things they were producing didn't actually like transform into policy. You know, they didn't sort of become um, an imperial apparatus that then governed those people's lives, um, at least not immediately or not to in a total way. So I feel like that's a difference too. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I guess like one thing I was also thinking about, uh, maybe to kind of bring it to a completely different scale and, you know, um, maybe direction is, um, you know, in some ways, like I think uh, these kind of legacies of, you know, plant representation and, um, uh, you know, I think a lot about, I think history of photography is being deeply entangled with the, the history of um, you know, botanical representation and illustration, um, you know, and, uh, you know, in some ways, like, I, I feel that, um, you know, as this kind of like pursuit of, you know, chlorophyll, of light, you know, of like greenness, um, the kind of 
led to the creation of a lot of technologies of vision, you know, of like, of visualization, uh, of preservation. Um, and, uh, you know, that has been like a really kind of, uh, you know, central, um, yeah, you know, just kind of central theme for some of like, you know, my practice. And I feel it's underlying a lot of these kind of questions of, uh, you know, colonial networks of exchange and, and what, what was kind of like the driving force behind a lot of these, um, you know, exchanges and transportations. Um, and, you know, the, I don't want to forget about, I, I guess, like the, the plants themselves, you know, the kind of vegetal agency um, and, you know, who is actually cultivating whom, uh, you know, where was it humans who were actually the drivers of these exchanges wow. or did plants themselves um, you know, kind of cultivate us, um, you know, to transport, to move, you know, whose desires are we kind of like looking at? Um, and so that is a kind of question that I've been kind of thinking about um, for a while, which I don't know, uh, you know, we're run running kind of like way over time, but, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of bring that <laughs> into the conversation. Um, but I think maybe this is a good time to wrap it up. Um, you know, I wanted to thank everyone again, Sarah, thank you so much for, um, you know, for everything, Tamina and Shireen. I am so grateful and so inspired by both of you. And I hope that we can continue this conversation further. Um, and, you know, um, I'm really looking forward to, you know, to see what else you guys are working on. Um, and thank you everyone for being here and have a good night. <laughs>